Good morning to you, brothers and sisters. Good morning to you, people of God. I want you to raise your expectations of what it means to encounter God in your life. What it means to encounter God through the word of God. Be open to God. Be open to God. Let God speak to you this morning. There is something God wants to speak to you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask you to show us something more of who you are and how awesome your presence is. Overcome our fear of the unknown and lead us into a new experience of you. May our worship today be as on a mountain top, a transforming encounter that empowers our discipleship from the rising of the sun until its setting, the Lord God has spoken. God shines out perfect in beauty. Our God is coming and will not keep silent. The heavens proclaim God's justice, for God himself is judge. Come worship the Lord our God with me. Come celebrate his faithfulness. Come to the mountain of transfiguration and be blessed. Thank you, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. We are going to hear the word of God from the book of Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 9. Morning, everyone. I hope you've had a blessed week. It's been pretty wet where I've been, uh, which is awesome. Uh, part of a farming family, so we love the rain. As Johnson mentioned, Mark 9, 2 to 13. Jesus is transfigured on the mountain. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice from the cloud uh, came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave, gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to, them, to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. As they asked him, why do teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come and they have done to him everything they wish, just as it is written about him. Wow, that's unreal. Imagine seeing Jesus transfigured. All right, uh, we'll get Johnson back to share the word based on this word, and can't wait to hear about it. Thanks, Johnson. Thank you so much, Brother Ben. Uh, as I was reading through this passage, something came out which I thought, oh, I'll give this as a theme, swimming with the sharks. Swimming with the sh sharks. In his most recent book, Developing the Leaders Around You, John Maxwell tells us something quite fascinating about sharks. Those fierce lavithens of the deep, sharks only grow, grow as large as their surrounding permit. The shark, strangely enough, is one of the most popular fish for aquariums. 
So the reason for this is that sharks adapt to their environment. If you catch a small shark and confine it, it will say, stay a size proportionate to the aquarium in which it lives. Sharks can be six inches long and fully mature, but turn them loose in the ocean and they grow to their normal size. So, I've decided to come up with a theme, Swimming with the Sharks. I've noticed the same phenomenon with regard to followers of Jesus Christ. If I were challenged to live heroic lives of Christ, we have that capability. Left unchallenged, however, most of us stay where we are. With an immature understanding of faith and a nominal commitment to Christ. Our lesson for the day contains one of the growing, stretching experiences that came from time to time for Jesus' disciples. Go with me to the top of mountain. Jesus is there as are his three most trusted disciples, Peter, James, and John. As usual, Mark doesn't give us many details about what happened on that mountain. Did they have a time of prayer? Did Jesus lead them in a time of meditation? We don't know. All we know is that suddenly the disciples saw Jesus transfigured. What does that mean, transfigured? We don't know exactly. All we can say is that somehow the disciples saw Jesus transformed in the glorified Christ. Who will one day reign over all our lives. So that's about as far as we can go. Right before the disciples' eyes, Jesus was elevated into a new plateau. Somewhere new. Mark tells us that Christ's clothes became dazzling white. Whiter, says Mark, than any bleach on earth could get them. That is what he says. So then he says, Mark, the disciples saw Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Moses, of course, gave the children of Israel the law. Elijah, on the other hand, was the greatest prophet of them all. So here, we, we hear the highest representatives of the law and the prophets. And the transfigured Jesus was in their company. And the disciples heard a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And the disciples were terrified. A crucial statement. The disciples were terrified. We can appreciate their response to this most unusual situation. We would have been terrified too. No one would not have been terrified. We hear about people experiencing strange phenomena, extraterrestrial visitations, out-of-body experiences. It is. But for the most part, the sorts of things haven't happened to us. And we are a little suspicious when they happen to other people. When other people give us testimonies of what happened in their life, we are always suspicious. Because it did not happen to us. And we would be suspicious of Peter, James, and John's report except for the way in which it affected their lives. This experience, as well as many other experiences they had with Jesus, transformed them radically. It changed them radically. You and I, 2,000 years removed, can make light of their experience. But it was so very real to them that they gave their lives for Christ. Literally. Christ was transfigured. And the disciples were terrified. Why were they terrified? Because they were dealing with something outside their own experience. They were dealing with something outside their own knowledge. He was Christ in all his glory. He was someone whose life shone with the beauty and integrity. They did not have. He was one dazzling white robe indicated his holiness, his purity, his uniqueness. And they were but ordinary mortals and they were afraid. They couldn't deal with it. Being, Christ in, being in Christ's presence made them aware of their inadequacy, their imperfection. They looked at themselves and see that, no, they were just sinners in the midst of a holy God. They were sinners in the presence of one who was sinless. No wonder they were terrified. Because they could see it. So to understand the grace of God poured out in Jesus Christ, we must first understand our inadequacy. 
our imperfection, our ugliness, as it were. But the transfigured Christ is in all his loneliness, in all his holiness, in all his glory, still loves us. Christ loves us. Irregardless of who we are, irregardless of our imperfection, Christ loves us. You know, I, I love mothers a lot. Sometimes kids mess themselves. And the mothers, they don't hold their kids in this manner if their children have done something. They embrace them, they hold them like this, even when they've messed themselves and go and shower them. They still love their kids, even if they've messed themselves. That is the love that we receive from Christ. Even when we are in our mess, he still loves us. That is the love we receive from him. There was no need for the disciples to be terrified, but they did not know that. All they could see was Christ's holiness and their own unworthiness. And they were terrified. They could not match with him. Then they were transformed. In that midst of being terrified, they were transformed. That is the second thing we need to see. They were transformed all, oh, not at once. Transformation really happens all at once. Don't let anyone mislead you. Few people are genuinely converted completely in all one night. Some people are stages in their life. So they experience on the Mount of Transfiguration what but one stop on the disciples pilgrimage to become apostles of Jesus Christ. So they would share many other important experience with Christ. All the time though, though something real and important was happening inside them, they were becoming more and more like their master. They could feel it within themselves and say, they are now becoming more and more like their master. They were becoming more committed to him and to one another. Their faith, which was not as large as the master's seed, was growing. They would stumble and lose hold of it from time to time, but they would always come back to it. And it would blossom into a mind faith that would shake the Roman Empire. Only these 12 disciples, they changed the world. They changed the world upside down. This man would move from being terrified to being terrific. <laughs> if I want to put it that way. From being terrified to being terrific. Their faith would grow from being easily intimidated to being almost invisible. They were in the process of being transformed by the presence of the transfigured Christ. And the same thing can happen to us. Like the disciples, we can be terrified in Christ's presence because we are imperfect. But we soon discover that in his presence, we are not without value and we are not without hope. We always have hope because if you are in the presence of Christ, he is the one in control. That's why I find that Christians, even during this pandemic, Christians are not worried. They are saying God is in control. In the midst of this COVID, God is in control because Christ loves us. Change is possible. Anything can happen. That is the heart of today's session. The proper response of the transfigured Christ is transformation. So to see the transfigured Christ is to be aware not only of our inadequacies, but also our possibilities. And he is, so shall we one day be. To see Christ as real is to experience personal transformation. To see who Christ is in our life is total transformation again in your life. Let, let me give you an example of a butterfly. It's the symbol of change which I can maybe make. A caterpillar goes into a cocoon. When it emerges, it is transformed into a beautiful butterfly. That's all I can say. That's the transformation that is needed. C.S. Lewis put it quite pointedly. He said, he, Jesus, never took the veg idealistic gas, when he said be perfect, he meant it. He meant that we must go in for the full treatment. It is hard, but the sort of compromise we are all anchoring after is harder. In fact, it is impossible. It may be hard for an egg to turn into a bed. It would be jolly sight harder for it to turn to learn to fly while remaining in an egg. 
We are like eggs at present. And you cannot go on identifying being just an ordinary, decent egg. We must be hedged or go bed. We must now learn to fly as disciples of Christ. No fear. So we should never remain in the egg for us to be useful. I like that imagery. Before we experience Christ's transforming power, we are unhedged eggs. To experience the transfigured Christ, first of all, is to be terrified. Then it is to be transformed. And finally, it is to be turned loose. To be turned loose to transform the world for which Christ died. We are transformers. We need to transform the world to change the world for which Christ has died. Who? We. You and me. We've got that power. Christ came preaching the kingdom of God, the reign of God in every heart. And it is to his followers that he has given the commission for the teaching and the preaching of this kingdom. That's you and me. We are to be transformed and then we are to be transformers. When you are transformed, you can't wait. You want to tell others of what has happened in your life. So you know how the story of the Mount of Transfiguration ends. Peter wants to build three booths. One for Christ, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he stay on that mountain. That is what Peter is thinking. But it is not Christ's mission to stay on the mountain. No, 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 no. And be worshipped. His mission is not for you to stay up on the mountain. His is a ministry of love and to the people in the valley, down there in the valley. So when we are up the mountain, we should not stay there forever. We should move down to the valley. That's where the people are. People are waiting for us down the valley. Yes, with their problems, with their situation, with their conditions, we are called to love them. And bring them. That is our ministry as well. That is our ministry. We need to talk. That is our ministry. When we have been transformed by the transfigured Christ, and we catch a vision of what the world would be, if we all lived under his lordship, then things will happen. We will start preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Because that is the most important thing. No longer would Peter, James, and John be content to live in his fish bowl. Christ had called them to bigger and better things. Now it was time for them to reach their full potential as these followers. And friends, it's time for us to escape the fish bowl as well. Suppose you and I had been there with Peter, James, and John on the mountain when Jesus was transfigured. What would have happened to us? What would have happened to you? Would we have been terrified? Would we have been transformed? Would we have been eternal, loose to transform the world for whom Christ died? Friends, the transfigured Christ is here. He is here with us. And he's saying to you, do not be terrified, but be transformed. Reach your full potential in Christ's full day. To see the relationship between environment and growth, look at nature. In this amazing event, we are given a picture of what we can hope for in our own lives. Someday we'll be changed to be like Christ. We'll be made perfect. Yet God wants to begin the process of leading us towards a godly and productive life right now. Not just a life. We are not supposed to just live an ordinary life, but a productive life. Think of yourself to say, how many people have now I've shared the word of God with and I've witnessed to who are willing to follow. During times of our struggle in Jasper, we reflect on who will become when God completes our transformation. We are reflecting to say, who will I be when I reach total transformation. So brothers and sisters, I just urge you, because you've been transformed, you, you, you no longer live according to your thinking. That's why the word of God says, 
This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. Meaning that we should stop concentrating and listen to our own emotions. Listening to our own thinking. Listening to our own understanding. But listening to Jesus Christ. What is Jesus saying to you this morning? Is Jesus saying something to you this morning? Listen to him. He's the only one we should listen to. Not to other things. Listen to Jesus. If you listen to Jesus, he will speak something to you. I know that Jesus does. May the good Lord help you as you think over these words to say, am I doing what Christ has called me to be? Am I really a transformer in my community, in my workplace? Wherever you are, are you transforming people to be like Christ? And are you also living just like Christ lived? His mission was to go down to the valley and bring people to God. God bless you this morning. May God help you. May God encourage you. May God inspire you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for everything that you've done. We thank you for the love you've shown. We thank you, Lord. Lord of all eternity. Prophets through the ages have met with you on a mountaintop. We join now in prayer to the mountain and ask you to meet us, to accept our worship, to inspire us, to increase our sense of awe and wonder that you are our God, transfigured and transfiguring. Father, be with us this morning as we are gathered here. Speak to us, Father, that we may hear. It is only to you that we should listen. All other voices are not good voices. Be with us, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, uh, I would want you to take your offering so that we can make our offering. It's time to thank God for what God has done to you. It's time to offer your life to God before you make an offering. I will pray for your offering at the present moment. You can see all the details, the account details are on the screen. You are able to pause and able to do your offerings. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bring our offering to you. It is only to you that we can offer sacrifices. Thank you for these offerings that we are bringing. May you bless them, Father, so that they can be used in the expansion of your kingdom. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you always look, uh, look after us, that you always provide everything that we need. Even when situations are looking really impossible, Father, you still provide us with all the necessities that we need. Amen. Let us receive grace. Lord Jesus, raise our expectation of what it means to encounter God, not just in this place, but in every place, in all the places we shall be in the days ahead. You help us every day to discover something new about God's ways, about what God wants us of, and the change where we see in the world, in the way we act. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.